Morgan, hi, hello, and welcome to the Female Startup Club podcast. Hello. Thank you so much for having me, Dune. Very nice to meet you. I'm super excited today to speak with you, obviously, for selfish reasons, like I was telling you before, of wanting to speak to people in the ALK space and the non-ALK space so I can understand what's working, what's not working, you know, what makes a brand successful, what the really tricky bits of being in this industry are. Um, So I'm particularly very, very excited about this today. What do you like to tell people in your introduction and elevator pitch in who you are and what you do? People, when they ask what I do, it's funny. I usually just say that I make drinks taste yummy. That's kind of my job. Um, Although in the case of a mess, we also, um, I also do product development on home fragrance and personal care products, but yeah, it's a, it's a difficult um, thing to really encapsulate, but um, I'm, I'm a maker by trade. Um, I'm a distiller by trade and I have a really fun job in that I get to formulate delicious beverages. Oh my gosh. Yum. I love that. You make yummy drinks. <laughs> um, I know that you grew up with a love of nature and you grew up in a creative household. You grew up in Canada and I know this is a big part of your story. So where do you kind of like to start your entrepreneurship journey? Well, it's it's actually funny because I'll, um, my sort of caveat is I, I did grow up in this um, artistic family. I mean, that said in a funny way, you know, people in the arts are often self-employed. So um, like growing up, my parents were kind of always hustling. They might be, you, you know, they might have, you know, be selling art or they might have a job for eight months. But that while we weren't necessarily my family aren't necessarily business people in the traditional sense of the word um i think that and and even my you know my grandfather is a visual artist so that made me comfortable with um the risks involved in not taking a conventional career path going to college getting a job at the telephone company with with good benefits or you know that kind of thing not that that happens so much anymore I don't even know if I could tell you my family are good good business people they're certainly independent and entrepreneurial in their spirit um, so that was I think actually a good foundation for moving into entrepreneurship that said um, the way I grew up there's kind of a narrative uh, that business people were these bad greedy people and or squares who just crunch numbers. And so the thought of going into business was never even a consideration for me when I was younger. And and then my movement into I, I, my previous career, I worked in the motion picture industry. Um, and then I, I, I sort of just transitioned into this particular career path. You know, it just started as a curiosity. I, I was curious about um, well, I had this love of nature and then was sort of interested in experimenting with how we could celebrate nature through um, beverages and taught myself how to distill. So this was really my, my current career really started as a hobby. I had it wasn't like I woke up when I was a little girl and I was like, I want to be a distiller when I grow up or and, or make booze. Um, so it just it I always it's always interesting hearing how people get into things and this really kind of started almost more of a intellectual curiosity. And then I moved into developing um this trade, this skill, um, or this craft really, which is distilled spirits. And since then I've moved into other um beverage uh categories. And then from there kind of thinking, well, maybe I could do this as as a business and really having no concept whatsoever. You know, I didn't know what a cap table was. I didn't know what, you know, liquidation preference was. I didn't know what a financial model was. For that matter, I barely ever clicked around in Excel. So I was a little bit intimidated and, you know, sought the help of people who I thought were, um, at the time, I thought were maybe business experts because they had MBAs. (laughs) And, um, the, the, uh, this is actually a funny story. One of the people that I, I sort of engaged to help build my financial model early on, um, I trust, and this is a theme of, of my life, um, trusting professionals because they have professional degrees. Um, so they must know what they're doing, whether it's a lawyer or somebody with, with a different type of professional degree. Um, 
I kind of discovered pretty quickly within several months of working with this person that they were a little dyslexic with numbers. And this is the person who was building my financial model. So the funny thing was, and this is a business pre prior to a mass. Um, the funny thing was, it was sort of trial by, you know, baptism by fire because I had to learn fi- my modeling, which is re- a whole business plan can really exist in a financial model. I had to learn modeling because I had to audit every single cell and every single equation in our financial model because this guy was so sloppy and that but that made me learn (laughs) and 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 then what i also learned is actually i actually absolutely love modeling um not fashion modeling financial modeling (laughs) well i guess it's like a recipe right you're working on a recipe within a document and you're making it come to life you're making it look good (laughs) taste good (laughs) I, absolutely. So, so it was sort of interesting. I think from there, that that force functioned me to develop a lot of skills. And then, of course, when you're fundraising, you know, you have to have answers to all of the diligence questions. So, um, I kind of just did it. I didn't go to school for business management. I just kind of did it. And I also found like. You know, I I myself found early on several men- mentors in the the beverage industry as a whole who were very helpful. And um, you know, I was like, well, should I go get an MBA? And they're like, oh my God, no, don't do it. Just like start this business, and you're gonna learn. So that's my very long winded um, way of encouraging people who don't have a business background but have an entrepreneurial idea to just go for it. Um, you know, it is a lot of work to learn you know, business principles, but I I would really encourage people to do it. Absolutely. And I think it's so spot on. Sometimes you're thinking about, you know, everyone else has the answer when really you're the person that cares the most about your business. You just need to get in there, knuckle down and learn it yourself and you're going to do it the best ever. And yeah, I guess an MBA is like building a business, sorry, is like an MBA (laughs) times a million (laughs) in real life. It really is. And, and that's, you actually bring up a good point, which is nobody, you when you're an entrepreneur, nobody's going to care as much about your business as you do. What any consultant, it doesn't matter how expensive they are, any employee, you're, you are the one left ha- holding the bag in the end. And no, you just have to accept the fact that no one's going to care as much as you. And this is also the, the other kind of sad part of it that you have to kind of understand is you know if you're um in a in a founder role or a ceo um no one's actually gonna people aren't gonna care about you um your employees i don't want i know this sounds kind of dark but like um you know the same way that you care about your employees and your people you you shouldn't really expect them to care about you so much so it's a little um i'm really glad that you're doing this podcast because being an entrepreneur is 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 kind of lonely a lot of the time Um, and, and it's a really, um, it can be a very difficult, um, the trying, um, endeavor in every sense of the word. Um, it's certainly the hardest thing I've ever done and it's good for entrepreneurs to connect because, you know, they also know how difficult it is sometimes it can also, it's also incredibly rewarding, but yeah. Yeah. There's like highs and lows in every day. I totally agree. Talk to me about Amass. How did it come about? How did you meet your co-founder, Mark? And what's the journey there? As I mentioned, so I I have a previous business that I founded, which is I I founded a a craft distillery located here in Los Angeles. Pretty soon with that business, I realized that um, our strong suit, and this is talking about pivoting, wasn't on the marketing, sales and marketing side of spirits. It was actually in the product development and production side of spirits. And th- that was for a number of reasons. But but frankly, sales and marketing isn't my area of expertise or my interest. I'm good at distilling and product development. And we just didn't really have the resources to launch our own brands successfully. So I pretty quickly I pivoted into doing product development for other brands, which was um, really, honestly, just such, such a great pleasure because that th- that's a really creative part of being of my profession and then also i really enjoyed collaborating and in a way assisting um, my clients um develop their brands some of them like mark 
Lynn, who's my partner um, at Amass, are you know industry veterans and incredibly knowledgeable and and incre- very very um, talented entrepreneurs. I lead, learn something from him still every single day. I deeply appreciate um, having the opportunity to, to collaborate with him. It's a real joy. So some are like Mark, who um, you know serial entrepreneurs have lots of lots of business savvy, and some people who this is their their first thing, kind of like when I started out. So. A mass actually started as a client, and so uh, Mark came to me um, before a mass was anything really, and and said, "I have this idea for this business, and I, we want to want." He, at that time, he wanted it to be sort of more of a traditional spirits portfolio, and he wanted to start with a gin, and he wanted it to be a Los Angeles gin. So from there, you know, I start. We kind of you know, played around with the idea of what, what that would look like and, and the sort of the mood and the spirit of this gin um, and the inspiration behind it. And we developed our gin, which it, that particular product has 29 botanicals in it. And um, it's sort of inspired by both the landscape terroir and the cultural landscape as well of Los Angeles. Now, a mass as a botanics brand, um, not just an omni-channel, omni beverage category and in fact omni consumer package goods category company was really an evolution so we launched a few products and this is i you know this is a great testament to having the runway being open to pivot and being and and being able to respond to consumer feedback and and insight and data you know when you have a, a a vision or a plan for your business. I think, you know, we say strong convictions loosely held, like, you know, we have a thesis about why this is going to be a success, but being open to the business looking completely different, I think was um, very empowering with a mess. And that's something that um, didn't really have in my old business, with my old partners. So it started as a traditional spirits portfolio, um, but my passion and my area of expertise in spirits really is in botanical beverages and celebrating plants and the whole concept of biophilia. Connection to nature and reverence for nature is actually something, especially in modern society, um, that it, that we really need. Um, we might just not have the words for. So we decided to just Instead of doing what all the other liquor brands are doing, we decided to just really focus on exploring and celebrating botanicals through beverages um, and having that be sort of the the overarching thesis of what we did. Um, From there, we just started exploring what that would look like in different beverage categories or even new beverage categories. So things kind of evolved there. And then actually soon after that, we were like, well, botanicals, um, you know, really are a central part of, of fragrance and also uh, personal care products. So why don't we just play around in, in that space too and, and see what happens? So I actually got to develop fragrances um, for our company too that are, you know, out of out of botanicals. And that was really fun. And, you know, there are a few, it was fun, but also it was really interesting because you're talking about, you know, ways to connect with consumers before you have, you know, a $50 million marketing budget, we just really as an experiment, we produced these home fragrance and personal care products um, that embodied our brand. You know, what we discovered was people were starting, even though we'd been in the liquor market and bars and restaurants and off-premise stores as well for a couple of years, we started to find that people were becoming, learning about our brand and becoming intrigued by our brand by these personal care products. Um, so it was in a funny way, it was like another way for people to kind of learn about a mass and um, in in sort of a, a, a realm that we, you know, that would not, that's just not a traditional marketing channel. And I imagine also a lot of um, like potential to reach your customers directly when they're not, you know, there are so many legalities around shipping alcoholic products to every different state in America and all the things surrounding that. It's a way to connect with people directly without having to go through those millions of hoops. Definitely. And yeah, you touched on, you know, the complexities of working in in the liquor space. I know the laws are different in the UK, but it's still very regulated and also heavily taxed. It's very, you know, in the liquor industry, it's very difficult to, A, like, I don't think there are any 
digitally native liquor brands. I mean, maybe house, but it's very hard to sort of develop and sell and market liquor brands on on the internet. Um, It's just starting to happen. And there's a lot of evolution happened with sort of force function because of the pandemic. But yeah, the regulations around shipping alcohol are are, um, quite draconian. So, um, you know, you have to get pretty crafty. (laughs) Yes, I I bet. I have had some people on the show before talk about you know, the challenges that they face um, building spirits brands and and alcoholic brands. I'd love to keep talking a little bit about your early marketing strategies when it came to, you know, finding retailers and building your kind of direct-to-consumer relationships with customers, even though you weren't able to ship directly to them and how you kind of, what was it that you were doing to gain traction in the very beginning before you had big marketing budgets and before you had kind of, the momentum i'm sure you've heard this before um you know and and by the way like you know we are primarily a beverage business we have our our personal care products which you know are in really incredible like you know five-star hotels and stuff like that but you know that's really our our focus that is our our focus you know when we in in the beginning um because you know you can't really do direct to consumer our strategy was to just focus our, our, our products are in liquor industry considered super premium so they are absolutely in in that top tier our strategy was a to hire a absolutely killer vp of sales jennifer marks um she that was she was sort of like a, a secret weapon um she came from uh perno and she really engineered um how we would enter the market whatever markets we would go go into um the accounts that we would target just focusing on getting into a cup like the uh, California, specifically Los Angeles and New York and Miami markets in our first year. So we did not go spread ourselves out too thin. We didn't have the resource to do, do that. Those are the biggest liquor markets in the United States. Anyways, we did hire boots on the ground salespeople, which um, is something that not all a liquor, we, we did have the capital to do that, which is very important. It's also very capital intensive in terms of headcount, but we did hire very talented salespeople in each of those markets. And then really it was, you know, a guerrilla effort, um, just going out and going out after those top 100 accounts in each city, trying to get, um, you know, back bar placements and menu placements, you know, traditionally when at least in the very least with with you know higher end products and liquor categories most brands when they're starting out um generally speaking are heavily weighted towards on premise before they move start selling in the off premise you kind of want your bartenders to be your brand ambassadors and you want them to be knowledgeable about the product and be able to share it with their with their consumers um so we did do that that that's a little bit of a convention in the liquor industry we did do that, and we're just starting to get into a little bit of chain retail um, through working with our distributor right before the pandemic. And so the pandemic was very interesting for um, challenger brands um, who'd only been in the market for a couple of years because, or little craft distilleries, et cetera, who didn't have good uh, retail distribution because in a lot of cases, like 80% of their of their sales happened at bars and restaurants that shut down. So um, that put back a lot of brands back, new brands back a little bit. In our case, we we're lucky in that we had just started to get into chain retail and we went from being a brand that was 80% on-premise bars and restaurants to a brand that was 65% off-premise retail. We're very lucky that we're able to do that. But um, I will say that time was very difficult for new brands. You mentioned that, you know, for you in the early days, you were able to hire a VP of sales uh, and you were also able to hire a team of salespeople on the ground and that that was capital intensive. Are you able to share kind of what kind of, you know, budget you need to have to be able to launch in that way or like what kind of runway do you need ahead of you to be able to do that right out of the gate so yeah this is this is a funny thing it, with, with with what we were doing in specifically in the in the liquor industry and I, I would say any other 
um, consumer packaged good or business, you probably don't need this kind of headcount. Like the liquor industry is very archaic and that you need those boots on the ground, people visiting accounts. Um, but for us, you know, it was really like, you know, the seed seed round was really, I think it was one to $2 million. To be honest, that was before I joined the company. So I, I can't give you an exact figure, but it was around that. So it, it is pretty capital intensive. I would not, you know, I know I have obviously lots of friends in the liquor industry and friends with, um, you know, young brands. And what I've seen is you really do you can you can bootstrap and you can do it for less money starting out um but it's just a much longer path to getting into market so you know we're lucky because mark is a you know he is a brilliant business person and he there are investors really know and trust and love him uh, so he was able to you know raise that that seed capital really easily but particularly for um liquor brand or beverage brand um you know, I, I see brands trying to do grassroots and and you really do need a great salesperson. That's definitely an investment that's absolutely worth it. They're also really hard to find in the liquor industry. So yeah, so that that's definitely part of the equation, I would say. Mm, that's so um, such a great insight and great to know your thoughts on that. There was something else I really wanted to ask you about and to talk about, which is that kind of difference of legalities around an ALK drink versus a non-alc because what I'm wondering and what I've been you know looking into myself recently is what are the kind of laws that apply to a 0.0 or a 0.005 non-alc bev like do you still need to jump through hoops or is it just the matter of it literally is like a soft drink and you can do all the things yeah, I don't know about 0 0.5. And of course, it depends on the country that you're in. But in the States here, um, you know, you fall, you shift from being in the in the alcohol category, which is governed by the Trade and Tax Bureau, which used to be the ATF. I always like to tell people I have to talk to the ATF all the time. <laughs> but and, you know, and, and there's both state and federal taxes on uh, alcohol on all alcoholic beverages, which depends on, you know, it's a different tax rate depending on what state you're in. Two, you, you know, you're really solidly in the food category, which is regulated by the FDA. So um, while you're not dealing with the taxes that are applied to alcohol, as well as the distri three-tier distribution system, you know, working through a, um, a third-party liquor distributor, you can't, you're not really, you're not supposed to self-distribute alcohol in the United States with um non-alcoholic you don't you don't have any of those things so it's non-alcoholic it's much more appropriate um for direct to consumer channels because you can easily legally um self-distribute mm -hmm. what are the kinds of hoops that you need to jump through with the fda and when it comes to that side of things the fda doesn't approve every label for example the way that they do in the liquor industry but the fda um you know, there are food safety regulations that you have to adhere to, labeling requirements that you have to adhere to. And, you know, you have to produce your product at a registered food production uh, facility. Um, so you have to work with co-packers that that's what they do. You can't just, you know, make a drink in in your home and distribute it. <laughs> uh, you, unfortunately, I always want to do things myself. But yes, yeah, so you have to work with um you know, a li like a licensed food production facility, but that's not that difficult, actually. And you, you know, to be, unless you're a food scientist, um, you probably want to hire um, food safety consultants. That's a that's a good one. That's a, that's an interesting thing that I I haven't uh, considered a food and safety consultant before, but that is obviously going to be on my list of things to do now. <laughs> When it comes to, this leads me kind of nicely into, you know, your non-alc and your body care products, you're obviously able to build more of your direct-to-consumer D2C side of the business. When it comes to marketing, what are you doing with your D2C channel that's really working for you and helping grow and propel the brand forward? Um, yeah, that's a good question. To be honest, you know, I'm really the maker of the products and, and more of the creative director. I'm we have an incredible digital team at our company that we really only fully put together about a year ago. Um, and so, 
you know, there's definitely, you know, the traditional ad targeting. Um, we have a pretty good email list, but beyond that, I wish I could tell you what we do. Um, but that's really not my area of expertise. So I feel like a little bit of a jerk, like saying what we do. And I, I think honestly, they've just been trying all sorts of different things to see, to see what works. We're really still in the experimentation phase. What do you think is the best advice you could give to an entrepreneur like me who's entering the non-alc space or someone listening who's entering the alc or non-alc space, uh, the beverage industry, I guess, coming into 2022? What do we need to know? What you need to know is you need to be very patient. Building a beverage, a liquor brand, takes a lot of time. You know, if you look at Tito's, Tito's was actually founded 20 years ago. And th this is actually also important if you're fundraising and you are like to just to sort of um, expectate, set expectations with investors. Th the idea that you're going to build a, you know, build a brand and it's going to scale and you're going to do, you know, $50 million in revenue in, in two years is just like, that's just not how it works in the liquor industry, even, and, and also non-alcoholic on, honestly, even though you're not subject to the same regulations and, and the three tier system, um, you know, non-alcoholic brands really, for the most part, still have to, part, you know, do the, the same sort of dog and pony show that liquor brands do in the market to a certain extent. I think it's important to just really know, like a, it, knowing that it's going to take a while, like on average, it takes maybe like seven to 10 years to build a liquor brand, just also for yourself, because, you know, I remember um, when I didn't know that in the early years of, of my entrepreneurial entrance into this, it was so frustrating, you know, even getting a distributor and stuff, it just, these things just took suit so long, it caused me a lot of, a lot of anxiety and heartache, whereas I wish that if I just knew this is going to take a while. I would have been much uh, happier. Also, um, you know, I wasn't, you know, I was doing, and just as an entrepreneur, I wasn't taking care of myself. I was working all the time and, you know, I didn't take a vacation for years. On Being an entrepreneur is a very creative job. It doesn't matter what, what field you're in and you have to step away from your work and go back to it to recharge, to get perspective, even if you're, that means you're just going to an art gallery for the afternoon. And I didn't, you know, I just didn't take any breaks for years. I got really burnt out. And, you know, in hindsight, if I took a week off here and there, it wouldn't have moved the needle at all. So I, I recommend that people take a week off every quarter, just to step away. When you come back, you have fresh eyes and, and you're inspired again. That's so true. And it's something that, I mean, I'm experiencing this already. I was like, yeah, we're going to develop this non-alc wine company. It's going to, you know, we're going to launch by Christmas, you know, a year later nearly. <laughs> I'm like, okay, well, it's three times slower, three times more expensive. It's taking a lot of time. But I also kind of appreciate that time because you learn a lot in the process and you have time to get other things in order, like your branding or your trademarking or, you know, early um, consumer feedback and research and all those other good things that you kind of do need to prioritize. So yeah, it's definitely one to keep in mind, even though <laughs> it's so frustrating sometimes when things move slower than, than you obviously want them to. Definitely. But yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I can really relate. And and, you know, self-compassion is really key to, um, you know, there's so much that, especially when you're a first-time entrepreneur, there's so many factors that are beyond your control. Fundraising, working with consultants, you know, there's a, there's a lot that's beyond your control and you have to be able to be in a state of grace with that and, and be able to, you know, do what you can with things that you you know, are in your control and then also be able to, you know, just be in the flow if things for circumstances that you can't control. I think that's a big one too. Mm -hmm. That's such a big one. At the end of every episode, I ask a series of six quick questions, some of which we might have covered, some of which we might not have, but I ask them all the same. So question number one is what's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? I think, well, 
you know, it's, it's funny, you know, I'm, I'm really more, um, the creative director or, you know, the, the, the product person, there's the why of a mask, there's my personal why, uh, you know, I have a real passion for what I do. And it really does come from this place of intellectual curiosity. But, um, you know, when it comes to beverage and, and whether it's non-alcoholic or, or alcoholic, you know, we're not saving lives, but I like, I like to make things that delight people and enhance their everyday life. It's sort of a quotidian. I like the idea of creating things that, that give people a little quotidian pleasure. And specifically with a mass, our portfolio, I'm sure you've noticed is we have non-alcoholic products. We have low alcoholic products. We actually, and traditional spirits. Um, we actually just launched, um, a, a, a cannabis beverage. So we're really interested also, and I'm personally also really interested in inclusivity, creating products for people also, all, you know, beautiful celebratory products for all, all sorts of people, whatever, whether they're drinking, not drinking, whatever the reason is for all of our products at a mass, very sensual products, like whether they're fragrance driven, um, you know, our lotions, et cetera. And then of course our, our beverages, it, for me, they do fall into these two different categories, which is social rituals. I think rituals are very important in modern society, but we don't, again, like we don't quite have the language for understanding that we need ritual. Social red rituals, people connecting, and then personal rituals, people connecting with themselves and connecting with nature. That's something I think we all may yearn for, and it's all part of our health, but um, we don't quite maybe understand um, the, the physics or the metaphysics of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. What a nice answer. Question number two is, what do you think has been the number one marketing moment that made the business pop? We did develop a strategic partnership with um, So House International, and that was actually a great opportunity because it allowed us to connect with their clientele. And there's a really good, like, brand synergy there you know we you know we did uh, we've been fortunate enough to get a lot of really good press um a lot of awards and accolades and critical acclaim you know we've been in the new york times and forbes and um i was actually just on the phone with monocle this morning um so that um that kind of consistent um press i think people are kind of there's a lot of liquor brands, but there's something a little editorial about our company. And so we've been lucky to get a lot of press there. Mm, you have a lot of great pieces online. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's, you have to keep, keep with, when it comes to marketing, you have to just keep, keep going at it from all sorts of angles and, and trying new things. I wish, you know, there's, this is why, mar you know, marketing companies are paid millions and millions and millions of dollars like you know nobody really knows what the secret magic sauce is there there's a few things you know uh conventions but it just try stuff out and so her house is a pretty good one it's a pretty great partnership <laughs> question number three is where do you hang out to get smarter what are you reading or listening to or subscribing to at the moment i'm a little bit of a luddite um I'm the type of person that I think would love podcasts, but um, just in my life, I haven't really had the opportunity or the time to listen to a lot of them um, with the type of work I do. And um, I also recently had a baby like 18 months ago. So um, in normal circumstances, I'm a, I'm a bookworm. I do a lot of research online, but I, I love reading books. I love reading physical books and I, I, I mostly sort of look for book re recommendations from people that I know and trust and respect. And that's really, that's still my go-to. You know, my mother worked in the, in the publishing industry. Um, I come from, a, actually, my family's been in publishing since the 18th century. Oh my God, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just um, drop that in there casually at the end. <laughs> so I've always been a big reader and... I like reading biographies of artists. I like reading technical things, but you know, I read a, I do read a lot of good thought pieces online. I think it's really important to read nonfiction. I think non there's something that happens to your brain when you read nonfiction um, that it just it kind of rewires your brain, and in a funny way, I think it teaches you to think differently. It's like brain you know, good brain exercise to read nonfiction. So you're not necessarily 
picking up data, but um, I think that's a very good thing. And of course it's fun. I actually recently read, <laughs> this isn't, a, if you're depressed, don't read this, but um, I'm a big fan of Michel Welbeck. I think he's quite, the French writer, I think he's quite fascinating. Um, he's a little galvanizing, but I recently read the, the Map and the Territory that's interesting to me about his writing and his, you can tell that his worldview has actually evolved as, he, as he's gotten older and put out more books, is he kind of looks at, at Western culture and he will he looks at, you know, often really the grotesque parts of capitalism and Western culture, and he, he dials them up to 11 and puts them in some sort of like hypothetical future setting. It's not like the Hunger Games or some horrible thing like that, but he really explores the human condition in the milieu of, you know, sort of hyper-capitalism, which I would say we're already in that situation. And um, I really appreciate that because I can relate to it. <laughs> I'm definitely going to link that in the show notes for anyone who wants to check it out and who is not depressed at the moment. <laughs> Lol. Question number four is how do you win the day? What is your AM or PM ritual or habit that keeps you feeling happy and motivated? Um, I'm a big fan of baths. I'm a big bather. Um, that real, I mean, I'm also an introvert. So I, I don't, you know, the pandemic didn't really bother me. I, I like being alone in my tower in the sky. But um, no, I'm a big fan of bathing. I realized I was an introvert during the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's good. It's good to find out, right? Because then you can figure out, you can find out how you, you recharge your batteries. Um, and, and, you know, honestly, just reading, that's, that's a big thing. I, I love a good reading session. Myself, question number five is, if you were given $1,000 of no strings attached grant money, where would you spend it in the biz? What's the most important spend of a dollar in your opinion? Working capital or product is, you know, essential if you don't have product to sell. You, you don't, you're not really in business. So, and, and um, you know, especially with the pandemic, um, you know, just in time manufacturing, uh, a, a bit of a thing of the past at the moment. But, um, you know, I probably put a little bit of it into actually producing the product. Um, but, but a big part of it into our people. And at this phase in the business, um, in our business, you know, we're, we're, we're a couple years in, but we're really still a nascent brand. Having really a talented team, um, is an important foundation for, you know, aggressive growth. You have to have that um, that infrastructure before you grow. So that's where I, what I would do at this point. Love it. Nice. And last question, question number six is how do you deal with failure? What is your mindset and approach when things don't go to plan? You know, I think any, any entrepreneur who's been at it for a while has had tons and tons and tons of failures. And I'll say early on, you know, the, the, and the stakes are often really, really high, but early on, I used to get really, really affected um, and, and have a lot of anxiety. And, and now things just don't really like, as long as I can learn from the failure, things don't really like, things don't really bother me anymore. Failure, it, it's a cliche, but failure is part of the process. And as long as you don't make it mean anything about you and you you have takeaways from it, of course, we try to do our best to avoid failing, but being an entrepreneur is risky. And, and I would say if you're not failing, you're probably doing something wrong. It's important to just learn. Absolutely. Absolutely. I totally agree. Morgan, this was so awesome. Thank you so much for taking the time to share about Amass and your journey and some stuff in the non-alc space. I'm so grateful to have had some of your time to learn from you. Thank you so much. Well, great to meet you. This was a real pleasure. Thank you, Dean. <laughs>